Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to, to this event. I'm so pleased to have uh, a moment just to, to say uh, welcome here and to introduce our distinguished guest uh, for an event that is so uh, on a topic that is so central to the concerns of the Kellogg Institute and to so much of our work. But even more, uh, it's a pleasure because it's an event that combines not just the topic, but so many important people to the Kellogg Institute. Um, our distinguished guest who will be introduced to you in a moment, as well as a wonderful panel of faculty fellows and visiting fellows. Um, and, and all of this due to the collaboration that we have established this year through Notre Dame International and the uh, Mexican Fulbright Commission that has allowed us to begin and to inaugurate this year, the first of the uh, Mexico-US Fulbright chairs. Um, and the holder of that chair this year, the inaugural holder is Professor Julio Juarez Camis, who is here as a visiting fellow and who has conceived of this event and allowed us to, uh, to uh, connect with our guests tonight. And so I'll turn the floor over immediately to Julio to provide that introduction. Julio, it's all yours. Thank you, Paulo, and uh, thank you everyone for coming over today. Um, I was just realizing that uh, welcoming one of my very good friends from Mexico made me feel uh, how fast I, I became uh, part of the Kellogg family. So you guys have done a fantastic job making me feel at home. So I'm already inviting friends over. So <laughs> I think you are doing something right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that. And. Um, and moving into our event today, uh, Lorenzo, who has been uh, very kind to accept this invitation, uh, I, I, I think it's a real honor to be here and to have him over, uh, not only because he's a very dear friend of mine, but also because he has performed a fantastic, I would say, job during his now eight years ahead as, as the head of the National Electoral Institute in Mexico. I think you are the longest serving uh, president of the General Council of INE, in, of the electoral authorities in Mexico. So I think that speaks volumes of your work and dedication, and of course, of your endurance. We have seen over the past several, not just months, but perhaps years, a increcendo, uh, an increasing uh, attack on electoral management bodies, not just in Mexico, but in different parts of the world. And that is something that worries us as academics and as citizens, but also as public servants. And something I learned from you working together uh, during my, my time at the INE is the, the, the moral code and the ethics that come with a public responsibility. So I'm very happy to have you over and thank you so much. And thanks Tom Mustillo as well, because he was a great partner, partner helping me organizing this thing and Aníbal and David that accepted to be part of this fantastic panel. So I will cut to the chase and I would just open the floor for our colleagues to, to come forward and uh, thank you everyone. And this is uh, something that we want to uh, put into context. Uh, this is not just uh, the case of the things I, and I, I see many of my students. Uh, we have been discussing electoral integrity across not just uh, the US, Mexico, many other countries. Uh, and I think we are across, at a crossroads at the moment. And today is a fantastic opportunity to address some of these pressing questions regarding the state of affairs in terms of the electoral integrity in our region, but in, in the world. And the, the, the name of the event is Anchors of Stability, uh, Public uh, Electoral Management Bodies and what's, what the role is. And the, I think the, the subtext or the question that is not presented there is without these anchors, with, where are countries going? Where are countries going without all these uh, controls and checks and balances in terms of democratic values and norms and practices? So I will finish with that and I will welcome my, my colleagues to please um, uh, proceed. Our, is, so uh, thank you so much again and uh, let's hear what they have to say, thank you.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here. I would like to start uh, uh, thank with all my heart to the uh, Kellogg Institute of the Notre Dame University. Thank you, Paolo, for your kind invitation. And uh, thank you, of course, Tom Mustillo and uh, Julio Juarez, my dear colleague at the uh, UNAM, at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and a former collaborator at the National Electoral Institute uh, for this kind invitation. For me, it's really a, a huge opportunity that I, I appreciate so much. I would like to say I have a very long presentation. I want, uh, I have a, a very a few counted minutes, so I'll skip many of the slides of this presentation of course, if you don't mind, I, I, I leave it, I mean, for uh, uh, if someone wants to uh, get deep in some of the information in, on it content, uh, contained. Well, the first thing I'd like to uh, uh, set uh, in order to talk about, uh, you know, the democratic challenges that the uh, electoral system is facing in the current days is to uh, set up with you uh, or command with you that democracy is not uh, in, in modern times, the current times are not facing its uh, best days. I mean, uh, there are not good times for democracy, not just in Latin America, but uh, I would say all around the world. Uh, in many uh, regions in which we uh, thought democracy was already established and had no problems, I mean, not deep problems. Uh, right now, we are facing uh, a process of, uh, of a get back and erosion of the democratic institutionality. Um, uh, as uh, Cicero said, mala tempora currunt, there are not good times currently for democracy. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, despite you know the, the process of expansion of democracy in the so-called third wave, uh, many problems comes with its expansion. Essentially, the fact that in many countries, especially in Latin American countries, this process of transformation of democratization comes with a lot of expectations that many things is a common life. I mean, uh, poverty and equality would be solved by the arrival of democracy. And as you well know, that's not a fact or a problem those are not problems that democracy solves itself. It depends on good public policies in order to solve them. No matter that, I mean, uh, uh, now democracies, and this is not, I mean, you, know, you maybe remember that maybe 30, 20, 30 years ago, we were talking about the challenges of the new democracies, uh, which were def very different from the challenges of the old democracies, the democracies of the north of the globe. Uh, well, right now, I think, unfortunately, when we uh, talk about uh, uh, the democratic challenges, uh, we talk about problems that uh, we are facing despite we are new democracies or old democracies. I mean, there are new phenomena that there is, is uh, 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 undermining, you know, the trustability of the democratic institutions or uh, even the functioning of the democratic procedures. Um, I would like to say that, uh, and, and this is not a, a, a statement of mine, but uh, many of the largest economists in the, in the, in the current times have already said it before, that uh, right now, uh, I mean, uh, we are living in, time, in times in which never has been produced so much richness but never has been so much inequality in the world. Uh, and that is provoking, uh, uh, unfortunately, a social discontent with democracy, uh, with the results of the democratic elected governments. Uh, as I said, we have, we're facing uh, a lot of uh, new, huge and structural problems of democracy, the greatest problems of, of our time. Uh, which uh, with more or less intensity, uh, no matter that, are present uh, practically in every democratic country all around the world. Uh, the persistent poverty, the large inequalities, uh, not, I'm not talking just, just economic inequality, the inequality is the sign of our times practically in every social uh, uh, ambient we, we, we study. Uh, the credibility crisis of many of the uh, fundamental institutions of every democracy, I'm talking about political parties and parliaments in first place, but not only. Uh, the violence, which uh, in different levels is present 
uh, and uh, threaten democracy. You know, democracy is by definition the uh, uh, the so solution of a political uh, dispute without violence. And of course, the polarization, which is increasing in increasing in many of our democracies. So, taking account that uh, uh, Latin aphorisma from Cicero, "Mala tempora curunt," but uh, it stands on us that the second part of the aphor aphorism, set peyora parantu, uh, but a worse time as are still for coming, uh, uh, do not uh, became a truth. I would like to talk about, to talk, uh, talk about four uh, uh, challenges, but the first one I will just only mention it because uh, I mean, uh, 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 which is the pandemic, uh, uh the, 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 the you know uh no one no society was already prepared for pandemic of covid-19 pandemic and uh, obviously in different places i mean uh, we face this new uh, this challenge but what i just want to point out is that uh, for many electoral management bodies it was a, a huge uh, problem to face off uh you know the pandemic and how to run elections without increasing contagious uh obviously there are there are no uh, one uh, set of point to face that problem i mean many countries such as america has anticipated voltation system or a mailing voltation system and so on but you must take in account that in many countries such as in mexico uh, it's banded any kind of votation which is not the presidential votation in the polling station the day of election and uh, to put together uh, uh, potentially 93 million people uh, in the same day represents sense uh, in all the ways you want to see, I mean, you know, a, a, a huge challenge. Obviously, obviously, right now, we know that if you follow, you know, the sanitary protocols, if you're very strict and follow the, 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 those protocols and, you know, the health measures to prevent contagious, uh, you can run elections without, uh, as I'd like to say, compromise the integrity or the viability of democracy despite uh, a pandemic. And after saying that, I will skip a lot of slides if you allow me. Anyway. The second uh, uh, issue, the second threat for democracies is uh, the one I already mentioned, the polarization. I would like to say just that polarization is not a new phenomena. Uh, polarization is common uh, uh, in the in the in the uh, dispute for democracy for, for power, the, even in democracy. Uh, the electoral campaigns are the natural and institutional space in which different points of view, different programs, different positions are contrasting them uh, among themselves in the face of the public, calling for the vote. Uh, so polarization is not the antithesis of democracy. But the fact is that in the current times, the polarization has not just increased, but right now we are uh, looking at uh, uh, a very delicate and warning phenomena, which is the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the combination of polarization on one hand with intolerance values on the other hand. Um, and the intolerance is, for definition, the anti-democratic value per excellence. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon. If you look back at the early of the last century, you can find how polarization and intolerance uh, uh, settle, you know, the, the scenario for the rising of the, some of the most uh, warning uh, uh, and dangerous uh, totalitarian experiences. I'm talking about fascism and Nazism, uh, which uh, feedback not just for the polarization, you know, the logic of a friend and enemy, you know, good and bad, white and black, uh, but also, you know, the assuming to assume with uh, intolerance values that the, you know, the, the one who is in front of you uh, fighting for power, even in democracy, is not a legitimated contender, contender, contender but an enemy. And uh, logically, uh, you fight against an enemy and you try to eliminate an enemy, which is, by the way, uh, a very deep anti-democratic uh, 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 perspective. The third uh, 
threatened for democracy comes from disinformation and fake news. I'm not saying anything new. I just would say, would say that as well as as uh, 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 as polarization, this is not a new phenomena. I mean, uh, uh, the lies and the fakes uh, are, are uh, common in politics since the beginning of the politics. Plato claimed, you know, uh, 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 the, the 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 fakers or the uh, uh, such as demagogues. I mean, there are many ways to call the fakes or the lies in in politics, but the fact is that the, the presence of uh, uh, social media and the spread of internet access uh, all around the world has uh, become uh, uh, or has transformed, you know, the, the, the lies, the, the fake news, the disinformation, the misinformation in a threat for democracy. Right now, there is no country, there is no democratic country who's not dealing with this phenomena. There are many ways to face on it. I won't stop a lot, maybe in the Q&A uh, uh, session, uh, we can get deep in this and these problems. What I just want to say is that uh, uh, there are two major ways to face on this phenomena. I mean, the disinformation and fake news phenomena. Uh, two great models to face in, uh, on. Uh, on one hand, uh, uh, there is the, the you know the so-called French model, which point out uh, in a regulatory and punitive uh, model uh, to criminalize you know the one who uh, spread to create fake news, to criminalize those who spread fake news, to criminalize the uh, 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 the uh, social media. Uh, 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 enterprises, if they do not uh, uh, shut down, you know, those uh, fake news and so on. I don't think it's the best way to deal with this uh, problem, especially because, you know, the frontier, because uh, what is not fair, what is unfair and the, uh, and, and sensory is, uh, is very delicate in a democracy. The other model is the one we have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, established uh, for the first place. We are not the only country, of course, but the force of first place in Mexico in 2018 presidential elections, which is uh, an opposite model from uh, the French one. Uh, uh, focused on fight disinformation with information, fight fake news and lies with information, with proper assertive opportune information. That's not easy. That's supposed to, uh, to strengthen uh, liaisons, which are not easy as well, you know, with the uh, uh, social media platforms. If that's the, the arena, the scenario in which, the arena in which, you know, misinformation spread its uh, erosive uh, 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 potentiality, well, we need to use social media to fight back and uh, uh, to uh, uh, set uh, opportune, clear, uh, simple messages in order to uh, 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 counterattack, you know, the the, uh, and the uh, misinformation and the disinformation and the fake news. Um, uh, last but not least, and unfortunately, as uh, Julio Juarez said, this is one of the main problems we are facing on. This is a very new problem. is the harassment that uh, uh, many electoral bodies are suffering uh, all around the world in many democratic countries, in Latin America especially, but is, this is not a Latin American problem. Um, I'd like to explain. Uh, and then be back because there will be time to 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 to, to change the slide. I mean, uh, what I intend to say is that the, as well as uh, polarization, as well as lies, are not new. Neither attacks and disqualification uh, of uh, the, the of the work of electoral bodies uh, is new. Are news uh, is very often, especially in countries like uh, ours in Latin America, uh, that uh, you don't have losers; you have bad losers. Uh, and uh, I'd like to 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 to, to remind uh, one conference that the former uh, prime Spanish prime minister uh, um, uh, uh, Felipe González uh, uh, entitled a conference in the late 19th in Mexico. He titles the conference uh, uh, like, you know, the acceptation of defeat as a basic condition for the well functioning of democracies. If you don't have 
the acceptation of defeat. You have bad losers. People had claims that they do not lose, but that, that, there, that there was a fraud. Uh, you have a, a compromise for uh, the well functioning of the democracies. Uh, I would like to quote another fantastic uh, South American writer, uh, Eduardo Galeano, in a fantastic uh, uh, piece about the referee at the soccer football. Uh, Galeano says, that the, that the referee is condemned to, uh, uh, to be hated by everybody, uh, by the ones who win uh, the, the, the game, because they will win, obviously, despite the referee. And, uh, uh, and obviously, those who lose the game uh, will claim that they lose because of the referee. Uh, well, that happens in many, in many occasions in the electoral game. Uh, and uh, the electoral referees, the, 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 the EMBs, you know, the electoral manager models, bodies, usually are uh, uh, attacked and, uh, and disqualified uh, by the losers. That's not new, especially in our countries. What is new is that those attacks and disqualifications comes from the governmental circuit, comes from the governments, or comes from the ruling parties. And on one hand, and in the other hand, the tone of this disqualification, the stridency of this disqualification should concern uh, everybody. Some examples of that? Well, the Mexican case in first place. Uh, it's not new, it's well known that uh, INE in the last uh, couple of years, at least, has suffering severe attacks and disqualification coming from the uh, ruling uh, uh, party and even from the presidency, uh, such as this one. I I'm not inventing anything. I, I, I prefer to quote some uh, cases. You know, the president, the president in the last, uh, during the ele last electoral process, uh, uh, claims that uh, at the INE and the, elect that the, the, the heads of the electoral bodies were not Democrats. And not only that, that we conspire against democracy. The narrative coming from the power is very powerful and is very dangerous because it hits on the basis of the trust of the whole electoral system or the president of the ruling party that claims that uh, after, of course, a decision who was not uh, according their interests, uh, such as the, the disqualification of uh, some candidates that didn't accomplish, you know, the financiation rules that said that they have to present a report of all incomes and outcomes, uh, said that uh, uh, INE should be ex exterminated. Or a uh, uh, huge entrepreneur, a uh, mass media tycoon, very close to the interests of the current government that said that INE should die. But that's not a Mexican problem. And sorry, Tom, I'm, 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 I'm running to the end. I mean, that is happening right now in Brazil. I mean, the President Bolsonaro has not just offended, publicly offended, calling stupid the member of the uh, Electoral uh, 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 Supreme Tribunal, but also disqualifying some of the anchors of certainty in, in Brazil electoral system, which is in the last 20 years, you know, the uh, electronic machine votation, uh, the electronic votation machines. Uh, and that's, uh, I mean, this is not the first time maybe you know what I'm talking about, uh, that uh, a president uh, sets or, or claims that there will be a fraud in, 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 in future elections, uh, obviously eroding the confidence which is fundamental for the world functioning of democracy. Or what has, uh, has uh, been happening in Peru, in which not just the menace uh, were in the discourse or the narrative against the electoral institutions, but those menace translate into physical aggressions uh, to the heads of the uh, electoral institutions. Or in Bolivia, in which all this, the whole prosecution organization of the state goes against the former president of the Tribunal Electoral, uh, Electoral Supreme Electoral Tribunal, uh, uh, that was the one who solved in the extraordinary elections, no, the uh, the political problem they face on, or in El Salvador, in which uh, right now, right now, for instance, uh, uh, this last week, uh, President uh, Bukele appointed at the computer service uh, unit responsible. At an officer of the presidential house, 
which obviously represents a capture from the government of the independent and uh, electoral institutions. Or, uh, which are, I, I, I'm putting these examples because there are many ways of how this harassment against electoral institutions is produced. Or in Republica Dominicana, in which is, uh, Junta Central Electoral has suffered one of the largest uh, budget cuts in its history. By the way, in Mexico, we are compelled to organize very probably, eventually, uh, um, a recall election next year, a presidential recall election, which by law should have the same uh, dimensions and condition and warranties than the presidential election, no, without, with uh, uh, the largest budget cut ever in our history. We have no money to do that, but we have, we are compelled by the law to set, uh, to, to, uh, to, to organize this, this uh, uh, electoral process uh, uh, with all the warranties set in by, by, the, by the law. Or Ecuador, and, and the examples goes on. I would like to finish just with three slides. Just to say that unfortunately, this is not a Latin American problem. Last week, we get notice that Boris Johnson's government in Great Britain uh, presented a bill in order to increase the controls from the parliament, which means the majority of the parliament, which means the government, over the electoral commission of Great Britain, which is an independent commission. Or, well, unfortunately, this is a, 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 a slide very close to you. I mean, after months and months and months of disqualification of the electoral system, of the electoral authorities, of the uh, 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 grounded, you know, distrust on the, uh, uh, the long term, and, and, and I'm the first to say you need a revision of your electoral system, right? But in which sense? But in which sense, in which direction? Because you can't renew an electoral system in two directions. Remember always that the, the route to democracy do not for, uh, stands just one way. It can be uh, held the return way. And it depends of us to defend democracy against those anti-democratic authoritarian regressions. Well, I'd like to finish with this slide. I'm not taking account what is happening in, Af in, uh, in Africa. I'm not taking account what is happening in Southeast Asia. I'm not taking account uh, expressions of uh, authoritarian regressions such as is happening uh, in uh, uh, Hungary or Poland or Turkish. I'm talking just of the examples I've just mentioned, but I would like to, say, to present them in, 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 in this map. So uh, uh, in order to, 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 you know, to, to settle this, this sentence, or we defend democracy, or democracy is at risk. No democracy is a one man, one political party, one ideology construction. It's a common construction, and the defense of democracy should be also a common task. So thank you very much. I'm sorry, Tom, if I didn't obey your... Uh, your role of referee in this in this session. Well, uh, thank you, Lorenzo, for that uh, presentation. Um, uh, I think there will be many questions in the audience regarding this bleak picture that you are presenting to us in terms of the state of democracy in many democracies. I would like now to give the word to my colleague Anibal Perez Dinan, so he can address some of these concerns. So please. Thank you, Julio, and, and, and thanks, Lorenzo, for this, for this wonderful and, and very concerning presentation, I would say. Um, it, this is a presentation that is crucial at this moment because we are in a time in which democracies are being dismantled from the inside, right? It's, it's the elected, democratically elected governments that are dismantling democracy in stages, and therefore I think that your, the, the challenges that you identified are, are crucial. Um, it seems that we live. It seems to me that we live in an in an age of what I would call electoral denialism of of some sort. Um, but but as I look at your map at the end, right? I, I think your map was is very interesting because it suggests that as as always as it has always been the case in Latin America, there is quite a bit of diversity about in in terms of the different situations, right? And as I looked at the map, I thought. It seems that in Latin America, we have three 
situations or three regimes or three types of orders in, in terms of how currently the, the executive branch is in relation with, uh, with the electoral management bodies and with the electoral process in general, right? It seems that there, there, there are some countries in which there is an ongoing crisis of democracy, right? The pandemic has, has created serious concerns everywhere. And yet elections are still part of the solution, are seen as part of the solution. And to some extent, the electoral management bodies in those contexts are in the background, right? We don't see them, we just see the elections doing the work. And so yesterday we had elections in Chile, right? Presidential elections in Chile. Uh, Chile had a, an election for a constituent assembly in May. And of course, there is still a lot of uncertainty in Chile, right? We don't know what's going to happen with the presidential election. And there is a lot of concern about that. The, the, the pathway of the, of the constitu constituent assembly in Chile is still very uncertain. But still there is a sense that even though Chile has been in a continuous political crisis for at least for the past two years, elections offer a, a path forward, right? And similarly in Argentina, about two weeks ago, we had uh, midterm elections. And for the first time in, since the return of democracy, the, the Peronist party, which has been the anchor of, of the system, lost the majority in the Senate, right? In a situation in which the government is highly unpopular. And so there is a lot of dissatisfaction with democracy in Argentina. And yet the electoral process, even if the country is polarized, the electoral process seems to produce an opening, a, a potential for solution, even if that's uncertain. So that, I think that's one, yeah. one optimistic scenario. On the other extreme, we have situations in which the electoral process and the electoral management body has been completely captured by authoritarian projects, right? Just yesterday, we had regional elections in Venezuela, and it was clear how in balance the situation for the opposition is. About two weeks ago, we had elections in Nicaragua, right, in which presidential elections in which the members of the opposition, the candidates of the opposition were uh, in prison, they were disqualified, and the, and the uh, Supreme Electoral Council in Nicaragua delivered for President Ortega this election in which Ortega was re-elected, quote unquote, with 76% of the vote, right? So these are situations in which, interestingly enough, it, the electoral management body produces elections that are unfair, but governments claim, the authoritarian governments claim, pretend that they are fair, which is a very different situation from the world you were describing, which is a kind of the new moment of, of electoral denialism in which we have electoral management bodies that are working fine in many countries, in Latin America and in the US and in many other places, and yet, it's kind of the opposite situation, right? The, the electoral process is fair, but political actors claim that it's unfair because they want to undermine the credibility of elections. Um, and as you, as you pointed out very correctly, I think this is not new, right? Sore losses have always claimed that, that elections, in many cases, that elections were unfair, right? This was common throughout Latin America in, in the 19th century, but we have seen a revival of this, right? Like Mexico in 2012, um, Keiko Fujimori in, in, the, in the June election in, in Peru, Donald Trump in the US in the last presidential election. But the most interesting issue, I think, the, the phenomenon of electoral de denialism that we see, as you pointed out, is that this is now coming not only from the losers, from, from the winners, right? It is incumbent presidents like President Bolsonaro who are undercutting the electoral management bodies um, when the, with the claiming that the, the same bodies that produce elections that elected them are somehow rigged against, against the will of the people. So it's clear to me that this, these three, very different three scenarios open a series of fascinating questions for, for political scientists, right? One obviously is why is it that different countries end up in these different outcomes and, and some of the Emerging discussion about the, the causes of democratic erosion have to do with that with this question. The other interesting question, I think, for political scientists is what are the consequences of these attacks against electoral management bodies for democracy and 
And I think Abby probably will talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but for me, the most interesting question is what can we do about it, right? When, when uh, the Kellogg Institute was founded 40 years ago, much of the discussion about our colleagues was what are the mechanisms that allow for a democratic transition? And nowadays, the, the key question seems to be what are the mechanisms that allows us to prevent democratic erosion? So if, if I can ask you for a, a minute, I, the question I would have is, what do you think that electoral management bodies themselves can do to protect themselves from these, from these attacks? And what is it that civil society can do to, to, um, to collaborate with that? Thank you so much, Aníbal. I think you have, you have done a fantastic job uh, contextualizing, uh, not just uh, keeping all the reds that you have presented in your map, President, but also trying to challenge those uh, categorizations in terms of the, all the peculiarities and differences and similarities across all these countries. So I think that's a very pertinent uh, aspect and, and, and perspective. So I would like you, Abby, to... to, to Please, yes, I know you have a presentation, so go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to join this uh, panel. As Lorenzo was saying, what we are really facing in recent times or nowadays is this series of uh, dangerous narratives. And you know, examples of that is when, for example, the president of Mexico uh, says that he doesn't um, trust the electoral institution in Mexico. Or um, when the president of El Salvador, my own country, uh, says that actually anticipating um, the municipal and legislative election says that um, it starts talking about uh, fraud and actually without uh, proof. So what I'm going to argue uh, in my intervention is that these kind of uh, narratives in one way are, are dangerous, at least for one reason. And that is because these narratives undermine the legitimacy of electoral institutions um, when they are being attacked. And actually, if these attacks uh, persist over time, this leads uh, to an important outcome. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen, but it could lead to the erosion of trust in electoral institutions, uh, such as INE, for example. And this is consequential for democracy because it can lead to lower voter turnout if these attacks and harassment that Lorenzo was talking about persist. So if we actually look at trust in the national electoral institution using data from the Latino barometer um, that was collected last year, what we see is that Mexico actually ranks at, at midpoint uh, in comparison to other countries. About 35.5% of citizens in Mexico actually um, state that they have um, high trust um, in um, the electoral uh, institution, so namely INE. And this is actually a high uh, percentage, is those that say, yes, I strongly uh, trust um, the electoral institution in Mexico. And we can see that, you know, only really in Uruguay um, and Colombia, over 50% of the population have high trust in uh, the national electoral institution. However, when we see actually uh, the case of Mexico, what you can observe here is that um, trust in the electoral institution in Mexico is much higher actually than trust in the government as a whole, the judiciary, Congress, the police, and political parties. Only the church ranks at the very top with more than 52% saying um, that they have high trust uh, for the church, followed by armed forces and the president. So why is important that citizens actually believe in the electoral system and particularly in electoral institutions, such as INE. 
So I look at some evidence and um, also using the, the same data from the Latino barometer for uh, 2020. And what I find is, not surprisingly, that there is a strong link between trust in national electoral institutions and voter turnout. So for those that actually in the case of Mexico who have um, high trust in the national um, electoral institution, um, they actually intend to vote at 8% points uh, higher than those that actually say that they have low trust. Um, in um, the national electoral institution. So even though, I mean, this is a, a significant change, it's a eight, uh, eight point difference. Um, and, you know, nowadays, uh, also based on our conversations with Lorenzo, uh, we know that INE is well ranked in terms of uh, confidence, citizens trust. Um, however, if we see again these attacks, what we might be seeing in the near future is the erosion of this trust and that this gap that we see here between those who have high trust in the national electoral institutions and those that have low trust might widen. And hopefully that's not the case. I mean, I'm not here just to, you know, uh, throw um, predictions that um, look very negative, but however, um, Personally, I'm not very encouraged, to be honest, uh, with the current uh, scenario that, that we are seeing. Um, in the case, for example, uh, of El Salvador, the attacks against uh, the electoral tribunal have gone as far as that in the proposal for a new uh, constitution, the the electoral tribunal has been uh, replaced. I mean, the proposal is to completely get rid of the electoral tri tribunal altogether. And so this is uh, certainly um, concerning. And this, 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 if these attacks again go on, uh, we might see um, lower uh, legitimacy um, of the national um, electoral uh, institution. And this can have consequences for um, voter turnout. Um, and so it's interesting to me that actually, if we were to see lower rates of voter uh, turnout, um, this might even affect uh, those who are engaging in these attacks uh, by actually having uh, fewer votes, right, that go to their own party. That's one potential outcome. So, so it seems that it's completely counterproductive um, to follow this strategy, right, of attacking um, the your own electoral um, national institution. However, again, it's, it's, it's dangerous if we see um, lower uh, trust in the electoral um, tribunals or electoral institutions that that might serve as a justification to do something um, like what is happening in El Salvador now. And that is really to try to capture and even replace the current autonomous institutions that protect democracy in the region. So I have um, also a similar question like Anibal. So the general question is what can we do? Uh, but also what can a national electoral uh, institutions do to promote a uh, citizen trust um, and voter turnout. Mm -hmm. Particularly say in a context like Mexico that not only we have the pandemic and the harassment and all, all, all going on, but in terms of voter turnout, we also know that high levels of violence have been undermining um, voter turnout in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, um, one of the questions, and I wonder also if there are any kind of legal uh, frameworks or tools that um, institutions like INE can uh, implement, and, and maybe these uh, are coming from um, you know, international organizations or, or are in the constitution itself to protect against uh, these attacks or even the likely um, or, or I mean, in the in the likelihood that actually um, the institution is undermined to the point that um, it might lose its autonomy if it's captured. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby and Manival, for your comments and your questions. Uh, I would just like to round up uh, and. Uh, 
add an additional question to your uh, to your head. Uh, so, and, and then perhaps you could address these comments and it will be fantastic to hear from our audience today and to hear uh, some of the comments and questions that might be presented to you as head of this electoral institution. And um, Anibal mentioned something that keeps uh, ringing in my head and it's the visibility that electoral management bodies have yeah. in, in the region. And it's no surprise that INE in Mexico has lots of visibility because all the, the, the responsibilities that have been attributed to it by uh, historical reforms in Mexico. Mexico mm -hmm. is one of the, the most hyperactive countries in the region, in Latin mm -hmm. America, in terms of electoral reforms. We, we are, seem to be obsessed with reforming yeah. the, the rules of the game even if, 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 if the outcome seems to be not that efficient, but we always go back to the drawing board in terms of better elections or more fair elections. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Abby was also presenting this question that for me is the, the diagnosis of not the sore losers, but the sore winners. So we have people getting access in power through democratic means, but then again, complaining about the, the, yeah. the, those who organized those fair elections uh, that saw them uh, victorious. So uh, having considered those uh, two uh, perspectives and given the visibility and the attacks that the INE has uh, mm -hmm. on a permanent basis, uh, what would you say is the role of communication in terms yeah, of a, a very, I would say, uh, uh, classic approach of, of seeing the referee as a non-visible, as a very discreet player, and that for some reason, perhaps not the best strategic reason, as you mentioned, Abby, has been taken into the arena by political players. So it seems that it's a good strategy to, to make the referee, referee part of the game, uh, at least judging by the decisions and by the, the narratives that some of the big political players are are are, uh, are uh, performing. So what would you say is the role of communication in terms of uh, dealing with all these attacks without going down to the arena and just wearing your mask and doing all these, uh, you know, uh, lucha libre jumps and, and being part of the fight? So how do you manage not to, you know, get drawn into, into that scenario? And, yeah. and still be present and visible and, and counter-attacking all these uh, permanent calls for you to, to yeah. come down. And, and yeah. for you, I mean, the, the electoral yeah, authorities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I will leave it there. I'm very, very happy to hear your comments. Okay, well, thank you so much for your uh, reflections, your comments, and, uh, and obviously your questions. Um, well, I, I think you're very, first of all, I, I agree with you. It's some uh, strange and, and despite all the problems, you know, uh, democracy seems it renews, not even authoritarian governments stops, you know, the electoral cycle. I'm not quite sure that many of the elections, as you said, could be called free and fair elections and therefore democratic elections. But, uh, but that's, that's another point. Uh, and there is a, a, a Italian theorician, Michelangelo Bovero, one of my teachers, uh, at the PhD that uh, claims that the, uh, you know, democracy uh, risks to become an uh, autocratic elective form of government if we do not care of it. Uh, but uh, I, I go to the point, I mean, to the questions. I think the, the answer of your question, of your main question, Anibal, uh, is uh, in some part uh, uh, answered by the, by, the, by the presentation of Abi. What I mean, the key bone to solve those or to face this threat is to, do not lose public trust in elections. I mean, the cycle is very simple. Uh, uh, you, can, you will not believe on, uh, if you do not believe in electoral authority, you won't believe on electoral results and you won't believe on, 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 on elected governments. I mean, there's a, a, a huge problem of legitimacy. Uh, I, I do not want to simplify the problem, but, but just to, to, to get very specific on it. So the problem is trust. How to build trust or maintain trust in this context in which, uh, I mean, the harassment against the institutions, and I agree with Abby, is uh, directed to undermine public credibility of, this, uh, uh, of the electoral institutions. So um, 
I think there are three main uh, ways to do that. Obviously, uh, 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 there, there are probably many other uh, mechanisms or strategies to face this problem, but I think there are three uh, main uh, uh, access or, or uh, uh, routes of action to, uh, I do not say avoid, but at least counterattack against those democratic, anti-democratic attacks. Uh, the first one uh, uh, just uh, is the one that just uh, 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 fully appointed. I mean, it's, it's communication. In times of fake news, of post-truth, in times of disqualification of this kind of narratives, uh, claiming frauds or uh, advertising future frauds, the communication is fundamental. I would like to say that right now, and, and, and we, uh, we experience it in our own reality, as, such as INE. Um, I, I would like to say that, uh, I like to say that in, in nowadays, uh, for lecture management bodies, it's, uh, it's so fundamental to have, you know, uh, well built and well operational uh, offices uh, in the technical and uh, organizational uh, uh, commitments of an electoral body. I mean, uh, th th those offices are so important, such as the social communication offices. Because right now, if, if an AMB only answers the attacks, or, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 make evidence on the fake news and so on, Electoral authorities are just making damage control. I mean, you're playing the role that the ones who attack institutions and want to spread, you know, the idea that uh, elections are not trustable uh, are playing on. So they, I think right now, as well as, you know, a campaign is very common to, uh, that in a political campaign, uh, you know, the candidate set uh, or the political party sets its own war room, no, I'd like to say the electoral management bodies has to set their own peace room uh, in order to, I mean, to, to establish uh, uh, communica communication strategies to build narratives, in many cases to explain uh, uh, issues that are technically uh, very complicated to explain. Many of our electoral systems has some kind of procedures and very very baroque procedures in some occasions, product of, of the distrust, you know, the, the, the political parties distrust distrust on the elections, and then they reform the laws and establish new procedures and new uh, requirements and so on, which makes running an election something very difficult to explain in many cases. Well, electoral management bodies should be able to explain very clearly, very precisely, with opportunity and assertivity what the people will see in an election before the election stands on. I mean, that is fundamental. We must catch the opportunity uh, to build our own narratives in order to complicate if someone wants to undermine electoral credibility, you know, the, the field for, you know, the, the, the misinformation or the fake news uh, grows up. I mean, uh, you must take the step and go forward and uh, get in advance. So to complicate the, 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 uh, the possibility that those uh, uh, narratives uh, 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 spread on and make it, its uh, erosion effect that the uh, people who uh, settle uh, intended. The second role, the second main axe, the second strategy, I think has to be with uh, strengthen, I mean, to, to build uh, partnerships and strength relationship with uh, a civil society organization. I'm not talking just about NGOs, I'm talking about universities, I'm talking uh, independent mass media. Uh, I mean, in order to uh, get uh, allies uh, uh, to, to spread and to, uh, 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 to uh, achieve and, uh, and uh, multiply this narrative. You cannot leave them the building of a narrative. That, that's, that's one thing, but you need them 
in order to, to, to settle what I like to call, you know, a safety bell, a civil society safety bell around these democratic institutions. Uh, Abby was talking about, I mean, uh, uh, about the, the, the trust in, in electoral bodies that uh, uh, shows a Latino barometer exercise. Well, uh, 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 those Latino barometer data were collected last year before elections. I would like to say, but, but the problem is that you can lose that uh, from one day to another. I mean, the building trust process is a very complicated process uh, 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 in which, you know, the achievements comes uh, uh, slowly in a gradual form and so on. And the, and the opposite, I mean, the distrust procedure comes in one day and you can lose all the work, the work of a life in just one event. So uh, you must take in account of that. And uh, uh, well, actually after elections, uh, INE has become the, the trustable uh, uh, civil institution in Mexico uh, which, I mean, despite, you know, the, those attacks that uh, I, I was pointing out. But that's what, that, 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 I, I think that's part of, the, that's the result of this alliance with civil society organization. And in the third place, I think uh, uh, we must rethink the role of international observ observation. Of course, the Mexican observation, but also international observation. And I'm ta not talking about the kind of observation in the in the, trans in the trans transition to democracy uh, period. I mean, uh, this is a new kind of observation. Is yes, of course, it's important to watch uh, what is going on on the polling station on the election day, how the votes uh, are counted. But I, I think the, the, the problems right now are more structural. It, 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 it doesn't. I mean, the, the elections day, yes, is a key day, but uh, and, you know, the undermining of the electoral process comes much more before. And then, the, the, you know, what I'm saying, in a, or electoral bodies should establish this, these alliances, not in order to get, you know, uh, 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 to provide a comfort uh, uh, scenario, I mean, uh, the, 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 the observation, the uh, uh, partnership with civil society, the international observation and the, the partnership with civil society organization should be as much as critical as, 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 as much critical as it can. I mean, we need this context of exigence, but that's one thing. And the other thing uh, is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the commitment to defend together democracy. So uh, uh, communication is fundamental. I would like to just to say, uh, uh, answering one last question of uh, uh, Abby, what are the legal institutional tools? Not just uh, uh, observation, as I said, but obviously uh, there are many tools. Uh, uh, the tools that, you know, all the, 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 the building of the, of the constitutional state providers, uh, the rule of law providers, such as, I mean, for instance, uh, uh, it, it, it's obviously that in a, uh, in front of this budget uh, uh, budget cut, this enormous cut budget cost that compromise the possibility that we organize a well done election in the eventual uh, uh, recall procedure. Uh, we we must go to besides the Supreme Court to present a a, 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 a legal procedure, a complaint in order that the, you know you know the all checks and balances systems works in the defense of democracy. I mean, we if you assume that the electoral manager but management bodies are the only institutions that have to protect democracy, we have a very specific function, which is run elections. I mean, the, the, the protection of democracy uh, should become from the whole, the entire building of, uh, of the, the democratic state, which uh, uh, allocates, you know, the judicial branch in a fundamental, such as it happens in the United States, uh, uh, historically, you know, in a fundamental uh, role. I think we would we would like to have some uh, questions from the from the audience. So I, I see uh, Hans here, and I see Hans over there. So why don't we start back there, and then I see two Hans right here, um, uh, right there. Then he's on the on the corner, just below. Thank you. Um, 
Buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Rebeca Santamaria. I am from Mexico, from Tlaxcala, and I emigrated to the U.S. when I was 15 years old. Um, first, I would like to thank you for all the work that the INE has put into making initiatives that foster gender equality and empower women in politics. Um, but I wonder how can we take the impact of these initiatives further to make sure that what happened in the electoral process in Guerrero State, where the political candidate running for governor was accused of sexual misconduct, and it, this and his disqualification from the race was not because of these accusations, but his overspending in the campaign. Um, I believe this is important because this represents a step back in ensuring that our Mexican's political leaders are people who embrace democracy, women's rights, and human dignity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I saw some hands there, uh, Israel. Just right there, yes. Hi, a little bit on, on the same uh, line. Uh, I would like to ask if you think that uh, representation and diversity among uh, electoral management bodies is as important as uh, you know, technical uh, details. I'm I'm asking because the 2015 incident. I mean, just as context, as part of a surveillance uh, of the government actually against the whole council, there was uh, a leak of a conversation of two council members of the INE, uh, basically, um, well, talking about a meeting meetings with the Ayotzinapa parents and indigenous leaders, uh, comparing that to Merchant Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. Uh, making fun of one of the leaders, Mauricio Matasoria, who is a Chichimeca leader from North Guanajuato, comparing him to uh, Tonto from Lone Ranger, and uh, which is a very offensive stereotype of Potawatomi and, uh, and uh, Comanche. And if, so this, this, on top of revealing that surveillance from the government, also uh, sort of put the finger on a deep wound of, uh, indigenous peoples in Mexico, around one of five, one out of five people in Mexico out to ascribe as indigenous, but, and they have actually reached democratic lives, but a lot of, the, of those are outside electoral systems, which are not recognized. So uh, the question is uh, if uh, this literal alienation can uh, actually diminish public trust on these electoral management bodies. And if the question of representation, which actually the, the INE has addressed in terms of gender equality uh, should be addressed also in terms of, uh, well, ethnic equality and the representation of, in, of indigenous peoples. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, should we have, the, the, I saw two hands, Alejandro and Jordi. Hello. Hello. So. Uh, Thank you very much for this interesting uh, talk. I would like to ask um, a question related to your uh, final words. What happens when there is a clash between the rule of law and expression for popular vote? And I'm uh, specifically referring to the case of Catalonia in Spain, where the Junta Electoral Central was uh, used, let's say, the rule of law and the abiding to the law to prevent a popular vote. What, what, what should be the role of a Junta Electoral Central? Should they be like a kind of mediation? Should be neutral? Should it be a political party more? So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. Um, first, I wanted to mention uh, that it's a real uh, honor to have you here, Lorenzo. When uh, I learned that you were coming uh, because of uh, Tom, I was pleasantly surprised. I think it's a real privilege for all of these students to have you here. Just to give some context, Lorenzo is not only a, a high-level public official, I would, I would say he's one of the top five most important public officials in Mexico, just for the students to have an idea. Uh, he's also a an academic in his own right. He holds a PhD in political theory from the University of Turin in Italy. And uh, he's an academic in Mexico, the top uh, public university of the country. Uh, he's done a superb job at, at phasing uh, 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 
powerful presidents and, and rulers in the country. And so we are honored to have you here. Um, I guess uh, other than that, I just wanted to add to, to the questions uh, on, on the harassment. I'm tempted to see some of these harassment as a, as a way of undermining the political rights of some uh, opposing group of citizens. I guess in Mexico, I would, I would, I, I'm tempted to think of the middle class, uh, the middle class as opposing the president and then the president trying to undermine the electoral uh, authority, not only for the sake of undermining it, but also for the sake of undermining the political rights of that, of that minority group. And so I wanted to get your take on this, on, on this and whether these attacks can be interpreted not only as an attack on the electoral authority, but also an attack on, on citizens as a whole. And then for all my students, uh, please ask, ask questions. Thank you. Okay, you heard them guys. So uh, I think there's one more question here uh, with her. Um, and then we can. Hello, hi. Um, well, my question is regarding one of your comments as well and the role of international institutions. You mentioned that we need something more than just technical fiscalization now. And also around this idea of narratives. Like I know that international institutions are becoming increasingly more important, but we also hear that they attempt against the sovereignty of countries. So um, I would like for you to uh, go deeper into what the role of international institutions could be and how we can fight this narrative of in Nicaragua, we are tired of hearing about how um, international institutions attempt against their sovereignty. And I've heard it also from the president of El Salvador. So I think um, it's, it's a, a grown narrative. Um, so how can we build a narrative against this, this idea that, that it's, yeah, it goes against. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's give Lorenzo some minutes to address some of these questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for your questions. And uh, I will start with Rebecca uh, in order, if you don't mind. Uh, well, that, the, the one you appointed, it was a very specific case that, uh, you know, uh, 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 provoked a huge public discussion. I'd like to say that uh, in Mexico, since 2007, but particularly since the 2014 reform, you know, the all oversight uh, uh, system were uh, resettled in Mexico in electoral, I mean, I, I'm talking about uh, 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 electoral oversight system, no? You, have, you know, the control in the, and the accountability of every income and outcome of the political parties, which is a, an, an exclusive responsibility, no matter if it happens in the federal level, you know, federal campaigns or local campaigns, federal or uh, national parties or local parties are responsible of being. Uh, since 2014 specifically, many uh, uh, requirements like prohibitions have been settled in law. Uh, that was re the result after 2012 elections, uh, a very, uh, um, uh, in which there were a lot of complaints about uh, uh, you know the financiation of politics and so on uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the successive reform the 2014 a lot of regulations uh, and new regulations were settled one of those regulations uh, established that uh, you know and the primary uh, campaigns generally in every political activity uh, that uh, in which uh, uh, funds were raised are raised and uh, expanded uh, uh, should be reported uh, daily besides in a, in a specific system. Uh, that uh, works not just for candidates or pre-candidates as we call in Mexico, you know, the, uh, candidates in a primary election, let me say like that, but uh, both for, you know, uh, institutions who make uh, uh, domestic observation or electoral observation, or for instance, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, associations who intended to become political parties. I'd like to set that this uh, just to point out how in a, uh, didn't, as many people claim, act with uh, partiality in the case you mentioned. Uh, one year ago, uh, several uh, organizations, uh, uh, citizens organizations intended to become political parties. One of them, 
by the way, uh, 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 supported by former President Calderon, intended to become a political party. They didn't present all the accounts, you know, all the accountability, and all uh, uh, in the formats and the, uh, uh, among the requirements that the law settled. The consequence at the moment was the general council vote against to give them uh, to, uh, the, the registration as a political party because of, you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, they didn't accomplish these oversight rules. After several months, 43 uh, among more than 6,000 candidates uh, uh, were uh, uh, unregistered, get their registration as candidates cancelled by INE, mostly for the same reason. One of those cases is a very famous case, uh, uh, was a pre-candidate that uh, uh, gets a lot of uh, accusations of sexual harassment and so on. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, we can sell the registration as candidate because he didn't provide, uh, as it was compelled by law, uh, you know, he didn't uh, uh, report uh, its uh, incomes and outcomes uh, during the internal campaign uh, in, the, in his political party. He, has, he said he didn't make any uh, campaign ads in it demonstrate that uh, there were some of them and at the end of the day we cancel the registration. Uh, many people claim why didn't you cancel the, its registration because of the sexual accusation? Well, I would say because that's not one of the part of the responsibility for Zine. What I intend to say, there was no complaint against INE, besides INE, against that, that person for sexual harassment. All the accusations were presented at the, besides criminal uh, uh, courts or uh, at the interior of its political party in the Commission of Honor and Justice or something like that, no? which absolved from uh, 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 you know, the, 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 those accusations. So at the end of the day, we didn't pronunciate ourselves as an electoral authority for those uh, accusations because they were not presented beside us. We are responsible, uh, yes, to oversight the, 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 the incomes and outcomes. And that was the reason why we can sell uh, that candidacy. Uh, but but I, 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 pretended, I, mean, I intended to underline that the, how in different cases, the INE applied the same rule and the same uh, 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 procedures in order to uh, set our, the, the impartiality of our conduct. Uh, about the second uh, question, uh, I would like to uh, uh, answer in two, in two, in two, uh, uh, um, uh, in two, in, in, in two uh, separate uh, 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 matters. First, the leak uh, of, a, of, a, of my phone call. Thankfully, I just wrote a book. I will mention the, well, the, 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 the title. You can get it. I don't know if, if it's in, by sale in Amazon or not. But I, what I intended to say is that I already explained what happened in there, essentially. Um, that was a private conversation, a very inappropriate private conversation, which was uh, 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 suffered, a high officer of the state suffered uh, uh, an illegal intervention, an illegal leak of that uh, 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 phone call. Uh, it's not an excuse of anything, uh, uh, but uh, 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 oftenly many people uh, underestimate uh, 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 that fact, which is a grave, a grave uh, 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 issue, according to me, I presented that they now, uh, a criminal uh, 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 yes, uh, nothing is happening. Once again, uh, the traditional impunity that uh, stands in Mexico, not in the former government, but also in the current government, nothing is happening about the, those uh, criminal investigations. The fact is, yes, uh, 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 th there was nothing to do with the visit that we received from the fathers of the 43 uh, and disappeared students in Ayotzinapa. Uh, 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 this phone call was about, yes, the visit of a so-called uh, indigenous governor, uh, um, uh, 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 an organization that claims the representation of all 
the people and, uh, and communities, indigenous communities in Mexico, uh, that uh, claims uh, uh, in order to repair 500 years of, uh, of uh, discrimination, that INES should provide them uh, 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 sieges, uh, seats at the, at, the, at the Congress. They, ex they uh, 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 exige that INE provide them, uh, they told me, how many sieges at the Congress will you, uh, seats at the Congress will, will, will you provide us? I mean, sorry, I mean, I, I cannot provide you uh, any seats. I mean, there is an election, there are procedures and so on. So how much money would you uh, give us to, to uh, uh, in order? There was a chantage, a, um, a uh, hoax. hoax, okay. Well, anyway, that doesn't justify my expressions at a private phone conversation. That's why, and that's not often in Mexico, uh, I, the same day uh, the, the leak was made public, uh, I offer a public apologize, and a couple of days uh, after that, I, uh, I make an appointment with these people uh, to offer besides officers from the uh, uh, and, and non-discrimination agents in Mexico and the Human Rights Commission in Mexico, uh, a, a private apology. Uh, what happens after that? And I must say, I'm very proud of what happened after that. Because as uh, 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 Alejandro said, I'm a scholar, I work with democracy and human rights issues all my life, all, all my life. And uh, despite a, a, a bad taste and an inappropriate expression in a private context, uh, what we done, and that's the second part of your question, uh, from me, we have uh, in, in, improved since 2018, uh, uh, several uh, affirmative actions in order to provide, you know, representation into discriminate uh, uh, historically, in many cases, discriminate groups. Um, I'm very proud to be the one who uh, 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 proposed to the Congress of, to the Council of INE the possibility of establish, uh, you know, a, a, a quote for representation of indigenous communities. Right now, we have 35 representatives at the lower chamber, 35 of 500 uh, uh, who, who people coming that uh, uh, belongs to uh, indigenous communities that are, uh, has been elected uh, because of these affirmative actions. Uh, uh, for instance, in Mexico, we have 28 uh, indigenous districts. And uh, in 21, the political parties should uh, present candidates that belong to political community, to indigenous communities. Uh, that's an affirmative action we take play, we, we establish. Uh, uh, also in the lists, you know, we have a mixed uh, system, electoral system, part majoritarian, part proportional. Uh, and there are several actions that uh, in order to uh, uh, provide you know, the indigenous community uh, participate at the Congress, are represented at the Congress. Uh, that happens not just for women. I mean, the affirmative, the gender affirmative actions are, uh, uh, are uh, uh, constitute a large list. That's true. The, the, uh, um, the parity principle is established in the constitution, uh, but uh, what is established in the law is the parity principle in candidacies. And we uh, established several uh, um, uh, affirmative actions in order to uh, 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 provide that the, this principle, the parity principle, was a, is a principle in the representation, not just in the candidacies. Uh, we have uh, uh, affirmative actions for Afro-Mexican uh, people. We have affirmative actions for uh, uh, people who, who suffer some uh, disabilities. Uh, we have affirmative action for people who, to, who belong to the, uh, they, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, organization of the diversity of sexual of sexual diversity, and we have also uh, in the last election took uh, some affirmative actions to, for the representation of the migrant uh, community, you know, of the people Mexicans who lives abroad. Uh, is there a clash? Sorry, I'm taking so much time, but is there a clash against uh, between rule and law and the popular vote? Well, it shouldn't. Uh, 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 be in a democracy, but 
Uh, um, I think you, maybe, I mean, uh, the resource of the classics of the political theory is fundamental. I mean, I, I, I want to remember what uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, wrote in the democracy in America. Uh, uh, democracy, the, the major threat said 150 years ago, almost 200 years ago, Tocqueville, the major threat of a democracy is the tyranny of majority. I mean, yes, in democracy, the majority has the, the right to decide, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, they cannot decide everything. And there are some limits in the, the majority decision. Uh, in first instance, you know, the rights of minorities, you know, the right to exist, the right to, the right to participate in, in the political process, and the right to be taken in account, would say Hans Kelsen's uh, another one of the greatest theoricians of democracy in the last century. Well, um, I think uh, that, that's, that, that's the point we have to establish. Um, on one hand, that the majority cannot decide anything in democracy. And in the other hand, the rule of law should be passed, you know, the test of constitutionality and legality. Not any, not any law uh, is, is uh, uh, compatible with democracy. Uh, but if it has already passed, you know, the test of constitutionality, there shouldn't be, and, and, the, and the majority cannot decide anything, there are limits of the capability of decision of the majority, there shouldn't be, you know, a clash between the rule of law and the, uh, the popular uh, decision, democratic decision. But uh, yes, you point out one of the major uh, study cases uh, uh, in the actuality, which is the Catalonia uh, case. Uh, yeah, sorry. International, the role of institution, international institutions, Camilla, Ana Camila. Well, I think that's one of the, of the main uh, problems we are facing on right now, uh, which is the lack of trust of international institutions. Uh, uh, I'm thinking in the OAS, uh, there is, uh, I mean, the, 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 the attacks and the undermine of the uh, electoral credibil uh, uh, the credibility of uh, electoral institutions is happening also in uh, uh, international institutions. I'm talking about UN, I'm talking about the regional systems such, a, uh, such as uh, OAS, or the uh, inter-American system on human rights, which is suffering strikes after strike. And uh, that's not a good thing uh, for uh, the preservation or creation of democracy. We must re- gain confidence on in these institutions. Without those institutions, there is nothing in the international arena than uh, uh, the natural law, I mean, the law of jungle. I mean, uh, we have, uh, th th those are civilization creations uh, uh, and we must uh, rescue them for the discredit, which in many cases is provoked, I assume that, by a, a very questionable uh, political decisions. So, uh, uh, but but uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, 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 cross our arms. There is something we have to do, and uh, and uh, once again, is, there is a trust issue in, in, uh, in this in this issue in this matters. Thank you, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Thank you very much, Avi Anibal. Um, of course, thank you to every one of you who came over today and who presented all these very interesting questions and comments. Thanks for the Kellogg Institute for all the support and all the fantastic team that has put all the effort together to make this happen. And uh, we have to close our, our event today. Uh, thank you for coming over thank you. From, thank you. from Mexico City. And uh, uh, we wish you a very good day. Your presentation will be available, yeah. I assume, so everyone who can uh, will have access to it. So. Thanks again and uh, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.